All right. Well, good morning, uh, everyone from uh, Bentonville, Arkansas. I'd love to say that it's a sunny spring day, but uh, the weather around here can't decide what it wants to do. So, um, but we'll take it. It'll be here soon, soon enough. Listen, we are here this morning with our friend Fahim Naim um, from Advantage Unified Commerce. And um, I'm super excited about this. Fahim and I had an opportunity to get to know each other a little bit last summer. Uh, I interviewed him and kind of talked to him about what they were doing at Ish Opportunity. And uh, we've had this event on the on the schedule now for, for a handful of months. And I've really looked forward to it. So I'm gonna just, a couple of things out of, out of housekeeping, just remind everyone, um, you know, what it is that we're doing here today. Fahim's going to be talking about, you know, Amazon 2022, some of the changes to the to the platform. And most importantly, what are the things that companies need to be doing today in order to be um, successful? Uh, Fahim's the head of Amazon at Advantage Unified Commerce. As I said, he's a former Amazon category manager, having managed one of the larger P&Ls on a global basis. He founded Ish Opportunity, which was an Amazon-focused agency working with many of the leading direct-to-consumer and Fortune 500 brands. Um, it was acquired by Advantage back in 2021. And so I know he's got stories to tell about integration. I think everything's been a great experience. He's uh, recognized as a leading figure on Amazon, frequently referenced and featured in publications and conferences. And a little bit about Advantage Unified Commerce. Again, thank you so much to Fahim and to Charles Kochel and, and the whole team there for help pull all this together. Uh, Amazon, uh, I'm sorry, Advantage Unified Commerce is a leading commerce agency supporting brands across uh, digital and physical channels. We're one of the largest Amazon agencies and advertisers managing over $2 billion in sales, $100 million in advertising on the platform. So that being said, that's Fahim, and we're going to get started in just a few minutes. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Conversations on Retail is actually my third uh, in, endeavor in the supplier education, supplier development space. I started eighth, a company called Ethan Walton in Bentonville back in 2006 and had a lot of fun really kind of pioneering in the, in the formalization of Walmart uh, supplier education, new supplier onboarding. Sold that company, started a company called Supplier Community that really kind of flipped the model on its head. And instead of shining a light on ourselves as the experts, we were shining a light on, on the experts that were within the community uh, doing, doing the work and solving the big problems. And, uh, and I sold that company a year ago. And what I wanted to do with conversations on retail was create something that was a little bit less formal and structured, where it's really more about like-minded people getting together and having open conversations about the things that they care about. So while Fahim has prepared a, a presentation, we want this to produce uh, dialogue. We want folks um, not just asking questions, but contributing insights and, and sharing some of the things that you've uh, experience in your own professional journey. So we're going to do things a little bit differently. Typically, what we do is we say, you know, send us your questions and, and we'll read them. But what we're going to try today, and hopefully this doesn't end up biting me, but if you've got a question, and I hope you do, um, use the Q&A, not the chat, use the Q&A feature within Zoom to submit your question. And then what I'll do is I'll give you an opportunity as we as we take breaks for questions. Um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll uh, let you know that we're going to do this, but then I'll let you uh, come on, on camera and on, on microphone and actually ask the, the question yourself. We want you to be a part of the conversation. So um, we've got a lot of guests here today. We're super excited that you're here. One of the other things we're doing differently in this uh, with conversations on retail versus Aether Walton versus supplier community, as opposed to charging people for each of the events that we host, we're charging companies one annual membership fee, which gives every single employee in their entire organization unlimited access to everything that we host throughout the year, both live and via our archived videos. So uh, if anybody has any questions about being a part of this, not only joining conversations, but par partnering with us to start conversations like these, you can see the join now uh, button in the footer of the conversations on retail Dot com website. So without further ado, I think we've taken care of the introductions. I think we've taken care of the housekeeping. We've talked about how we're going to deal with Q&A and how to make this interactive. So Fahim, again, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for the time that you've invested uh, in, in preparing for this. I'm going to turn it over to you. Wonderful. Well, appreciate it, Matt. Uh, pleasure to be back on here. And uh, Amazon is one of those topics similar to fantasy football for me, where I could probably talk uh, days without, uh, without end, but we only have an hour. Everybody has to get back to their day job. So why don't we jump right in? So let's go through the agenda. We're probably going to go about, uh, hopefully about 40 minutes, spend about 10 minutes talking about general overview of what's going on in Amazon right now, a little bit more broad strokes and trends. 
and we'll get into some um, very specific new features that Amazon has released, many of them under the radar, but I think very impactful for brand owners. And then we'll spend probably the, the final 20 minutes going into specific advice on ways that you can win in 2022 um, to make sure that this is very um, productive and, uh, uh, and something that you can take home. Quick disclaimer is there will be no mention of Will Smith or uh, Chris Mock as part of this. I think we've had enough of that, at least I have. So let's jump right in. I'd like to start off with a quick brain teaser, give everybody a couple of seconds to look at this chart. And I know I can't hear any guesses, but uh, some of you may be thinking this is how much of my hair has gone gray over the last two decades. And while you're probably not wrong, we are gonna give you a different answer. This is it's a lot of words to say, this is the uh, share of sales, gross sales that the third party sellers have had on Amazon. And if you go back to that graph again, one more time, it's gone from 3% to 58% in 2019. Some of the 2020 and 2021 data hasn't been confirmed by Amazon, but many people uh, believe it to be in the low 60% range. And talking to many teams at Amazon, they believe that number is probably going to go to 65 or 70 within the next couple of years. Uh, and I love this quote by, by, uh, by Mr. Bezos. Um, I'll skip the big part of it, but I, I love this. Uh, third party sellers are kicking our first party butt badly. Something that uh, Bezos said in his 2019 shareholder letter and shows uh, as we go through some of these features, why I think that the tides are starting to turn a little bit in terms of where features are being uh, launched and, and why um, in some scenarios, products uh, or features only be available on, on Sell Central, which is what we'll call 3P, um, uh, as opposed to Vendor Central. So let's jump in. We've just started a little bit about the growth of Amazon 3P. Many brands under $10 million right now uh, have been switching to 3P. And for the first time, and we work very closely with a number of different teams at Amazon to support our brands. For the first time, probably ever, I've seen uh, Amazon being a lot more open to the idea. It, it, it almost been taboo if you were a 1P brand that wanted to transition some of your products to 3P or transition your entire account for a number of different reasons. And it seems like Amazon is being very focused on, um, on, on allowing certain brands to do it if you do it in the right way, um, especially brands that are under that $10 million range as Amazon continues to set the bar higher and higher and what it takes to get active vendor, man vendor manager engagement. So that's one going down Prime Day. Uh, it will likely be in July. My best guess or what we're using internally is July 18th or 19th. So that's a, that's a date to circle. Uh, the way we got to that is we're looking at some of the deadlines that, that Amazon has released in terms of when promotions and, and shipments need to be at Amazon. Um, so if I'm right, somebody owes me coffee. So let's see. Amazon advertising costs. So uh, many of the brands uh, or, or prospective brands that are not yet on Amazon have probably heard stories about how rapidly Amazon CPCs have increased over the last 12 to 18 months. It's primarily led by two or three different um, reasons. One of them is uh, if you've been following what's happened on Facebook and the iOS privacy changes that occurred uh, mid last year, the cost of doing advertising on Facebook for many brands has gone up two to three X and it's become less effective. Many of those brands have started to reallocate their budgets to Amazon. At the same time, many of the larger CPG brands have uh, continued to reallocate more and more spent to Amazon. So all these things um, are combining and Amazon's continued to grow and, and gain more market share. All these things are, are combining to lead um, CPCs uh, through the roof. Next topic is inventory limits for FBA sellers. Uh, they've gone up much higher at the beginning of COVID. Uh, we went through a little bit of a roller coaster on can you send inventory? It depends by product, if it's a new product, if it's uh, an essential item or not. Uh, and where Amazon has settled now because they've invested so significantly in additional warehouses and staff to manage some increased volume is that the inventory limits, knock on wood, subject to change, uh, are significantly higher than they had been previously. Hopefully, that's this. Uh, I'm sure it will get compressed as we get closer to Prime Day, um, as well as the Black Friday, Cyber Monday holiday peak period. But hopefully this is much better than what we lived through in the last two years. I know that was um, a huge thorn on uh, for many different brands that were trying to send in inventory, just didn't have space to do that at Amazon. Next one, customers, this has been happening again over the last decade. If you continue to look at some of the reports out there, customers that are serious about buying something, 
whether it's on Amazon or in stores, they're starting their research on Amazon. Some of the stats show that two and a half times more often than Google, they're starting their research on Amazon. That doesn't mean they're always buying it on Amazon, um, but oftentimes those customers are starting to do their research. And we've all been there. We've probably been at a Best Buy or Walmart at some point. We're looking for some additional product info or help make a decision. Went through uh, our phones, pulled up product reviews on Amazon, looked at the content, got some additional information, then up to the buyer to decide where they ultimately want to buy. Uh, but they are oftentimes using Amazon as a product research tool. Couple more general updates, COVID comps. Um, for the first time, probably ever, some categories are down year over year. And this kind of started as, as expected second half of last year. And in some categories is continuing this year. There was such an explosion of sales on uh, in e-commerce and particularly on Amazon because, uh, um, during the COVID time period that it's been difficult for many brands to, to continue to increase the, the, the level of, of volume that they did um, just about a year ago. So for the first time, I think Amazon has been one of those places, and I've been working on the platform for at least a decade, kind of all tides rise, as long as you're doing the, the bare minimum, your category is gonna continue to grow, so you should continue to grow. And in some scenarios, as customers are starting to go back into stores, that, that's not necessarily the case. So while Amazon is gonna continue to grow in total, and, and it has been in this time period, there are some categories that I think are facing some unique pressure, and and will require brands to be more aggressive and more focused than ever before. MSRP increases. So MSRP is what we'll call the, the price the customer is paying for a product. So we'll, we'll talk about this in two buckets. One is on the 3P side. So if you're an FBA or FBM seller, it's a little bit easier to increase your prices uh, to, the, to the end customer. There are some rules around if you increase it more than 10 or 15%, Amazon's probably going to slap your hand and give you something called a pricing health issue and will suppress the buy box. But um, many brands that we've worked with in Q1 have tried about 10% increase on prices and the customers seem to be undaunted. Uh, as we like to joke, many customers are already paying more for Netflix, they're paying more for gas, they're paying more in stores for products. So you shouldn't feel scared to ask customers to pay more where you can. Brand health issues, so now we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail later on in the presentation. Brand health is the idea that if an external competitor, so if you're selling on a Walmart or a Target or a Vitacost or whatever the platform is, Amazon is becoming more focused than ever on matching those prices or on the vendor central side or the 1P side or on the 3P side, highlighting that you're no longer priced at, at parity with some of the competitors. And as a result, they suppress your buy box, your advertising doesn't, doesn't run, et cetera. And Amazon's been doing this for a couple of years now, but they've increased the frequency. So you'll find out in a couple of seconds now that your price is, hot, uh, is higher in Amazon than other platforms, as opposed to previously, it may or may uh, not have, have gone on the radar for Amazon. And then cost increases. So the counter side of the MSRP uh, conversation, if you are a vendor central brand or 1P brand, it's difficult, but not impossible to get your cost increase. So the cost that Amazon pays to you. Um, we spend a lot of time working with brands on what the right narrative is and how do you make sure that Amazon understands that they're still going to get uh, their total margin? How do you make up for some of those things? How long does it take to get Amazon to approve it? It's absolutely not a bulletproof um, plan because Amazon has made it such, but it is possible. And there are some alternatives that some brands have leveraged where if you don't have an active vendor manager or if a vendor manager is not willing, you can start transitioning some of those products where it makes sense, FBA. Some scenarios we've had brands create new ASINs or create bundles to try to counter some of those issues. So easier said than done, I'm sure. But ultimately, as a brand, you have to figure out your COGS have gone up, the cost of your containers have gone up, the cost of your labor has gone up, have to find a way to, to, to the cost of your advertising has gone up. So you're getting squeezed on all sides, have to find a way to make sure that you're, you're still profitable as you scale on, on the platform. Cool. So I went through that fairly quickly, general updates, because I want to spend more time on some of the specific platform updates and new features. So we'll go through kind of about two uh, two handful of specific examples. This is not exhaustive, but there's some of the ones that I want to um, highlight. 
Many of these features that we're going to go through are available on both vendor and seller central. So both 3P and 1P, although some of these as of right now are only on 3P for a couple of specific reasons. So first and foremost, one of the most powerful things that brands can and should be doing is A-B testing on a regular basis. And what we mean by that are oftentimes called split testing is through Amazon's platform. There was a, a poor man's way of doing testing previously. You have to measure the results separately, but you have no idea if there's other factors that are going on. If you wanted to try this uh, main image here versus this main image, if you wanted to try a title starting with one word versus another title starting with a different word. Now through Amazon's platform, uh, it's currently accepting titles, main images, and A plus content. My hypothesis and many people um, would agree that they're probably going to continue to expand. I wouldn't be surprised if bullets and secondary images also um, become available for this. But you can essentially upload both of those at the same time and you get very granular data. Here's a screenshot of a test that we're running that says there's a 57 probability, 57% probability that version B is better. In some of those scenarios, those are real dollars. When you say just by moving one word in your title and starting with this word versus that, or changing your main image, or changing your A plus content to be more mobile optimized. Uh, in many scenarios, it can have a, a fairly significant impact with a, a minimal effort. So you should continuously be testing and we'll talk about some best practices separately. Manage your customer engagement. Another feature that I think has went under the radar and Amazon hasn't done a great job of telling the story. Brands have been asking for a long time for Amazon to allow brands to be able to communicate with previous customers or customers that, that are engaged with the brand for a new product release, for products that are on sale, et cetera. And Amazon's taken some baby steps to get there. So the program that they've created and, and many of these programs that we're reviewing are for what we call brand owners. So you need to have brand registry to have access to it. You can now send customers that follow you. And we'll talk about what that means in a second. A number of different emails that uh, they'll receive for new product announcements, featured products, promotions, holiday gift guides, et cetera. And Amazon's continued to adjust us even in the last three to six months. You can now... Theoretically, you'd be sending an email at every seven days if you wanted to. Probably more than I would recommend because of, of a number of different best practices that, um, that you should keep in mind. But Amazon is, is really opening up the ability to engage with customers that, that, that want to be engaged with you. Right now, the filter is brand, customers that follow your brand. So that the way that you can increase that is through Amazon Posts and Storefront. We'll talk a little bit about posts separately. We have a hope that Amazon will continue to expand that to make it any, anybody who's previously purchased your product. But as of right now, the people that are following your brands are, are able to get these emails. Here's a, another amazing feature that Amazon has released that's gone a little bit on the radar. Right now, this is for brands on Seller Central 3P. Amazon got some negative heat about a year ago when they remove the ability to comment on reviews, which is a best practice that I think many brands that um, we've worked with at least were, were participating in. If somebody kind of like you're on Yelp, if somebody left a one-star review, you used to have the ability to comment publicly to other customers. While they took that off, they did um, release something that's um, almost, almost as powerful. You now have the ability, you have to use Amazon's template you have the ability to message most customers that have left you a neutral or negative review directly. And then through those two pre-built templates, you can either provide a full refund or you can provide them customer support. We've seen some, some very interesting case studies so far for brands that are leveraging this where customers were willing to update their reviews or somebody who left you a one-star review now has become a loyal customer because of your engagement and reaching out to those customers. And, and previously, while you had the comment feature, oftentimes the customer who left a negative review never saw it. So it's a great feature to, uh, to people that have access to it that absolutely should be taken advantage of. Data, data, data. So Amazon announced some of this late last year during the Amazon Accelerate. This just became available, the brand catalog performance a month or two ago, the query performance, I think a day or two ago. And what this is, this is going to be extremely powerful for, for marketers and for brand managers to be able to understand what are the general searches that customers are, are looking at. 
until now, Amazon has been extremely guarded on what kind of data it provides to, to brands on search volume if it, if it has not happened through advertising. So on advertising, of course, you can see how many impressions and how many clicks you got, but you don't necessarily have great access to organic data. So when a customer is typing in, in this example, face wash, how many customers are typing that in on a weekly basis? How many, how many times did my brand show up? What percentage of time uh, or the brand share uh, is my brand um, currently for that term? How about from a click perspective? How about from a card ad perspective? And how about from a purchase perspective? So Amazon's now providing some of this data, very, very granular and extremely powerful to, ke- to, to match up with your advertising as well as your content performance. And then similarly on the brand catalog, you can look at a lot of information by product uh, and a lot of similar information. Still very fresh. We're still reviewing this to ensure that this is something that's actionable that we can we can leverage, but we're really excited about having more data. There are a couple of other things similar to this, like the product opportunity explorer that Amazon's recently released to help explore demand for new product ideas. And then another feature that Amazon released two days ago, um, oh, somewhat separate for this, but for a uh, PSA on Seller Central, you can now access your mobile clicks and your mobile impressions. So how many customers have visited your detail page via mobile as opposed to desktop, which was, was uh, to nobody's surprise, we've seen 50 to 60%, in some cases more, uh, 60 to 70% of customers are visiting your page via mobile, which is <clears throat> extremely important, again, to keep in mind as you're optimizing content and you're thinking about tech size and some of those things within the content. Virtual bundles, this does exist technically on the vendor central side, although you need a vendor manager to help create some of this. But on the FBA side, Amazon, uh, and this is still uh, technically in beta, allows you very easily to create virtual bundles where you're putting two to five different products together. Can be multi-packs of the same product, but multiple products. The powerful thing about this, this shows up on your detail page. So customers that are looking at your single ASIN, if you build multiple that right under that, it'll say, an example right here, make a bundle, look at these uh, different options. And then when you click on there, it'll show you what those bundle items are and what what your savings are. This is still, I would say, in its infancy in that you're still paying the FBA fee individually in this scenario. So there's not necessarily a, a cost savings yet versus a customer just buying two individual items. But it's a great place to start doing some testing and learning. And the other thing is, from an advertising perspective, there are some limitations. You can't run sponsored product ads on it, but you can do sponsored brand ads, et cetera. My full expectation is as we get later on uh, throughout the year, Amazon will continue to open up more and more features. But again, very, very powerful to understand um, how to cross-sell different products together to customers. Got about two more, and then we'll um, go on to some more specific tips on what else you'll be doing in 2022. The brand referral bonus. Taking a step back, Amazon is really putting the onus on brands to be able to provide traffic to Amazon um, in, a, in exchange for more visibility and money back. And what we mean by that is Amazon has a program called the Amazon Attribution Program, where if you're a part of the attribution program and enroll for it, you can now track how many customers are coming to your page from external sources. Once you generate some of those URLs, you can put that in social media, you can run um, so, uh, uh, social media external ads to Amazon, you can do them in press releases, et cetera. If you do that and you also enroll for something called a brand referral bonus, Amazon's even willing to give you 10% of the sales back. This right now is currently for sellers only on the brand referral side, although attribution is open to both vendors and sellers. But what that means is currently on FBA, for most categories, you're paying 15% commission. Amazon's reducing that to about 5% commission. So basically saying that you're paying us very little commission in this scenario if you're willing to drive traffic to Amazon. As a brand, that's a question that you'll want to ask internally. Do I want to drive more traffic to Amazon as opposed to my own website uh, if you have a strong DTC presence? But we've worked with brands to say, let's do it in a controlled, focused manner. Let's do it for a couple of weeks right before a peak holiday. Let's see if that gives us a boost on SEO. Let's see when we do that on a new product launch. Is that a great way to accelerate reviews? And even if it's not an ongoing effort, um, is there ways to do this in bits and pieces where one of the biggest concerns brands have had is why would I send a customer to Amazon and pay Amazon uh, commission for that? And if they're largely waiving, that could be a great way to test that out. 
And last new feature, Amazon Posts. This has been out for a little while, also still in beta. This is what I'll call Amazon's, uh, again, uh, poor man's version uh, attempt at Instagram. Right now, it uh, primarily shows up on mobile, although at some point, we believe it will show up on desktop. This is an ability to leverage some of the content oftentimes that you're using on, on Facebook or Instagram or external social media onto Amazon. And it shows up down below the fold on your detail page. And it shows up on competitors' pages if Amazon thinks it's relevant and it's free. So the more often you post and the more relevant your posts are, uh, we've had some brands that we've managed their Amazon posts have extremely high engagement and they're, they're continuing to show up on competitors' pages um, at, a, at a very significant volume. And again, it's free. So it's absolutely something that we would recommend you look into if you haven't uh, leveraged so far and continue to, to invest in and, and find a strategy so that this becomes a regular weekly, monthly effort, daily effort, uh, as opposed to once in a while. All right. So now we're going to go into 10 specific, this will be tactical. Uh, hopefully we'll provide you with something constructive to leave with. What are 10 things that you should be focused on to, to win in 2022? Number one, we talked a little bit about this earlier, ongoing content updates. It is extremely important to regularly be A-B testing and trying out new main images and titles and bullets and A-plus content. And the way we've, we've found success for many brands is, is continuing to measure your conversion in your traffic. If you have a 26% conversion on your top sellers right now, how do you make that 28? How do you make that 30? How do you make that 32? How do you continue to increase your click-through rates on advertising? And a lot of that's gonna be through testing. So we recommend at least four main images per year you should be testing. And in some scenarios, it may be a lot more than that. And quarterly updating of copy. So even if you, have copy that you think has been really strong and has been vetted previously, you should be A-B testing. Is this word now more important than this word? Oftentimes when we're working with brands and we look at the trending keywords through brand analytics, something happening in the algorithm and this one term that was a lot, that was way more popular became less popular than another term. And unless you're, you're testing this regularly, there's almost no way for you to really know and identify. So on a regular basis, you should be testing out, should I start with my brand name first or should I put my brand name third? or fourth keyword as part of it. Should I start off with men first or should I start with women first if it's a product that's unisex, et cetera, et cetera. Similarly on A+, we just said that nearly two thirds of traffic for many brands is occurring from mobile. If that's the scenario, is your content mobile optimized? Is your text large enough? Oftentimes on A+, or generally on A+, you can zoom in. So many brands will create content that looks great on desktop, that has a ton of copy. And then as soon as you look at it on mobile, because you can't zoom in, it's really difficult to read. The customer doesn't want to squint when they're on Amazon. They're probably going to skip over it. So what are different things that you could be doing on A+. What are some of the major questions and concerns and, and causes of negative reviews that are popping up? Can you talk a little bit more? Can you address some of those different issues through your A+, content? And can you continuously um, uh, update your, your modules accordingly based off of new products you exist, et cetera, et cetera. So I think ongoing content updates, it should absolutely not be a set it and forget it. This is a content I've had from, from last year. It seems to, be work, uh, seems to work and, and I'm going to keep it that way as opposed to an ongoing um, update. So that's number one. Number two, deal tags. So not all tags are the same is my, is my um, what I like to say uh, when we're talking it to our brands. What we, what we mean by that is a 10% coupon versus a 10%, let's say 15% coupon versus a 15% lightning deal versus a 15% price discount versus 15% prime exclusive deal. They may all have very, very, very different results and performance. And here's a couple of different examples down below. So limited time deal, you see there's a strike through in pricing, there's a coupon, there is the lowest price in the last 30 days. So there's a number of different features and we spend a ton of time working with our brands to try to figure out what's the optimum way to, to increase click-through rates. So if you're running a 10% coupon or a 10% deal, should it be a coupon? Should it be a price discount? What are the rules behind price discounts to ensure that this red tag shows up? And we've seen two to three X greater performance, same discount amount just by having the right bad, badging. I think the way to think about this is you want to create a promo calendar. You want to look at the SLAs and, and some of the requirements on, on um, how, how long it has to be for between deals for Amazon to be able to leverage some of this. 
and then start off with some of your key peak events, Prime Day, Turkey Five, which is Black Friday, and Cyber Thanksgiving, and Cyber Monday, et cetera. And it can have a significant difference even on that time period. But if you start there and create a promo calendar, it helps you determine what kind of promos to run as opposed to if you're like, you're always playing catch up on, should we, we be running a 10% coupon now? Um, if you plan this out accordingly, you may get much more bang for your buck. Number three, cross-selling. So look for opportunities to cross-sell your other products, easier said than done. But there are some ways that Amazon has provided to, um, to provide that, that in additional information to customers that have bought from you that are, are interested in your brand. You can create assets showing your full product line on some of your main images. We've seen a lot of success on brands on their sixth or seventh image. They have a picture that talks about the entire catalog and customers are um, pleased to find out that there's additional products that uh, they weren't aware of that you're creating. There's a storefront opportunity to, to really tell that story. A plus, there's a comp comparison grid that we've had a lot of success in, down below the, the folds. Buy X, get Y promos, virtual bundles or hard bundles. Hard bundles meaning you physically package and created a uh, new ASIN and you're shipping that versus vir virtual bundles is what we reviewed before. A number of things on an advertising perspective, sponsor display is a great tool um, to retarget previous buyers. You can, and Amazon has continued to update the look, um, look back window. So customer that's bought from you, 90 days ago, may be interested in your next scent or your next flavor, depending on your product lines. It's a great way to continue to advertise, sponsor product and sponsor brand ads. You can showcase your hero ASIN, what some of your new ASINs, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then variations as they make sense. So oftentimes we've seen with brands that provided, have come up with new interesting uh, updates to the products. You put it on the variation with one of the core ASINs, you get a lot more visibility and over time you can break it off. It's a great way to, to accelerate the new product launch. Let's go to Amazon Business. Amazon Business is one of those that also not a lot of brands think about, but there's a, a reasonable return with a low amount of effort that, could, that can happen from here. There's a couple of different ways to engage with Amazon Business. For the purpose of this conversation, quantity discounts is probably the best way to start. The great thing about quantity discounts is they only show up to registered Amazon Business customers. So something like, if you buy three units, you'll save 5%. Buy five units, you save 10%. You can offer a discount on one unit if you want, or you can only do that on, on a, a larger quantity. For many brands, you may not think that Amazon business, your product makes sense for Amazon business, but a lot of small businesses use their Amazon business account for personal searches. So we've seen brands in health and personal care and feminine care and CPG, um, and furniture, et cetera, 10 or 15% of their sales right now is coming from Amazon business. And all they've really done is thought about their quantity levels and provided some kind of discounted offer for brands that, uh, for customers that want to purchase in bulk. It's a great opportunity to look into if you haven't yet. Number five, operational excellence. This is table six, managing your in-stock rates for FBA. You should have at least six to eight weeks of cover. I'm a big believer in Murphy's Law. If you, if all of your shipments get checked in within two or three days, but the one time that your inventory is down to one week of cover and you send a shipment, that's going to be almost definitively the shipment that got lost, that got, uh, that had a, a ton of issues and took three weeks to get checked in. And that's when you go out of stock. It only happens when, when you really need the inventory to get checked in. So where possible, Amazon storage is fairly cheap, unless it's a, a very large and bulky product have more weeks of cover to avoid some of that where possible so that you don't have to worry about uh, that last second increase demand right before a uh, uh, out of stock effort. Similarly in vendor central, you can use born to run. You could look at your, you should continuously be auditing your top sellers and your second tier and third tier SKUs to make sure that you have enough inventory. And if you don't, you work with a vendor manager, you run promotions, you look at born to runs, et cetera. Daily audits. I think this is also extremely important. On a daily basis, you'd be surprised the number of times we spend every morning going through our best sellers and we see surprises all the time. Your best seller rank, you may have been number one in the category, all of a sudden you dropped to number seven. You may have been number two for a specific keyword and all of a sudden now you're on page three. Your pricing is all over the place. You've lost the buy box. Somebody has updated your main image even though they te technically shouldn't have been able to do that. So unless you're looking at this on a regular basis or subscribing to different tools, 
Um, I think a, a daily audit on your top sellers is extremely important. We've seen this increase at, at more frequency over the last six months than ever before, where you have huge fluctuations on your end. You think you haven't done anything different, but all of a sudden your sales are down 50%. And as you look into it, some for some reason, your keyword is no longer indexed, or for some reason, somebody updated something or you lost your buy box and you weren't aware of it. I think operational excellence is, is absolutely uh, the starting point of the foundation. Where you have the ability, drop ship both on the vendor and seller side when you're out of stock. If you do have the ability to provide dropship and minimize better if you don't go out of stock at all in your prime offers, but when you are going out of stock or when you see that Amazon has some delays, if you have the ability to provide a dropship offer, uh, absolutely can help you. And then on vendor central, enter your promotion three weeks in advance where possible. This really has a huge impact for many of the brands that we work with. They wait, they, they sometimes wait too long to enter the promotion onto Amazon or they do it after the fact. And it causes a couple of different issues. Amazon doesn't know the promo is running, so they don't, they don't order enough inventory. So you're selling through inventory, you may go out of stock and Amazon doesn't have enough time to replenish. Or in, uh, in a similar uh, uh, vein, Amazon doesn't know they're gonna get funding for those promotions. And Amazon has been a lot more sensitive and providing these errors on advertising saying you don't meet the financial threshold. So it may have been your best seller, all of a sudden, because you didn't enter this promo a couple of weeks in advance, your advertising stopped running during that time period. So you can avoid that by entering your promo a couple of weeks in advance if you're aware that it's gonna happen and it can oftentimes save a, a ton of headache later on. Number six, we've got about five minutes left, so bear with me, hopefully this is helpful. Advertising, we can have a, seven hour conversation on advertising best practices. But uh, in the context of this conversation, the big things that I, I would like to mention is because CPCs are going up so rapidly, you absolutely need to be testing out new strategies. You need to think about new keywords, new ad features. Oftentimes Amazon is releasing things on a very, very frequent basis on advertising standpoint between sponsored display and, spot and, and API updates and DSP. It's oftentimes a first mover advantage if you start off. You're paying way less than you would if you launch this feature six months later when everybody else is. So we highly encourage leveraging those new betas and new ad types. You should continuously be testing out new headlines and videos and assets in your ads. We've had a lot of success with path to purchase campaigns where you have a storefront tab, going back to that men or women example, where you run an ad just for men, you link that customer straight to the tab that's just about men, or you do the same thing for women and then your messaging and your images and uh, the landing pages the customer gets is very different. It's very unique to that specific target keyword. And we've seen a lot of success again um, by being a lot more uh, granular and focused. You should be continuously be testing out new keywords to rank for. So even if you've been on the platform, even if you're doing $50 million a year, there absolutely are new keywords that you should be testing. How do you do that? How do you make sure that you have the right SEO for that keyword? How much money are you willing to invest? What are the KPIs you're going to measure, et cetera? And then finally, budget management. Because CPCs have gone up so quickly, we've seen a lot of brands go out of budget halfway through the day. And we've spent a lot of time trying to manage that where possible so that you're available throughout the entire day. So I think budget management, especially now as, as costs are going up and budgets are probably not going up as quickly as costs are going up, I think is, is going to be very critical. Last slide. Manage your margins. As a brand, you have to make money. Otherwise, it's not going to be sustainable. And again, you're probably getting squeezed on a number of different ends. So look for opportunities for price increases where they are possible. If you're on Vendor Central, really focus on eliminating chargebacks. If you're paying five or $10,000 a month on chargebacks for SIOC or for um, on-time delivery or for ASN compliance, those are ones that should theoretically be easy to maintain. That's all money that you can add to the bottom line or reinvest in advertising. And I think it's low hanging fruit. Evaluate any packaging or shipping changes to improve margins. Instead of shipping small quantities, if you're an FBA seller weekly, can you do an LTL shipment or an FTL shipment once a month that helps bring your costs down by 50%? Is there anything you can do from a packaging perspective? We've worked with brands where a difference of a half an inch on your package can be a difference of 30% of your costs on the FBA fee because the, the way that FBA fee structure works and similar in Vendor Central in, in some regards. Look at any packaging changes. Can you eliminate something so that you can save some, some costs on your FBA fees? 
returns. We talked a little bit more about um, how you can address it through better content. Is there anything else you can be doing from a returns perspective? Um, are you messaging customers that are leaving, uh, that are giving you returns to get a better idea? Is there updated content? Are there inserts that you can be looking at to minimize returns? And then finally, balance your short-term with a long-term goal. Amazon, oftentimes, there is a lag on, on, from effort to results. And what we mean by that is, you may say, you know what, this month I lowered my <clears throat> ad spend by 20%, but my sales didn't go down. So maybe I should do that going forward. Oftentimes, if you do that for two months in a row, you'll see that the impact of your sales going down and losing SEO and losing your bestseller rank may happen a month after the fact, two months after the fact, and it's, it's an ongoing effort. So think about the short term along with the long term. Again, absolutely, you need to be making money on the platform um, so that you can continue to scale and invest. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense to be on the platform. But how do you manage? How do you keep that in mind? One way to do that, which is number eight on here, is focusing on your customer lifetime value. If you're a D2C brand, this is your, 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 your life. Uh, this is your bloodline. You're thinking about your CPAs versus your customer lifetime value. What we mean by that in a simple term is if you look at ROAS only or ACOS um, only to determine how much money you can spend, you're probably not keeping in mind that that customer in many categories, they're buying from you three or four times a year, let's say. In those scenarios, if you're looking at ROAS on a single purchase, it may say that it's unfavorable and you're not making, making money in that single purchase. But if you look at that customer, that customer on Amazon is very, very loyal. The customer that's subscribing on uh, subscribe and save oftentimes doesn't churn for six months to a year, much higher, much lower churn than, than on DTC and other platforms. So think about that customer lifetime value when you're calculating how much money you should be spending to acquire that customer. And then focus on ways to increase the repeat. So part of it is measuring it and part of it is finding ways to increase it. Are there new variants? Can you use that manager customer engagement to engage customers that have bought from you? Can you do things from an advertising perspective with retargeting via sponsored display to target that customer that bought from you 90 days ago but hasn't bought yet? And you know the, the life cycle of your product is about 60 to 90 days, et cetera. So I think lifetime value is, is a great way to help maximize um, or increase your margins um, uh, to counter number seven. Number nine, channel management. We, we're, we're seeing brands have a number of issues with losing the buy box from resellers or uh, having brand health issues from external channels. So what can you do to better manage your resellers if this is an issue? Do you want to look at map policies? Do you want to look at 3P enforcement services? Review your distributors? Amazon transparency, which is a barcode um, that you can add to your products that provide some level of, of sophistication to minimize some of the resellers. Do you have a case for brand gain? Um, not easy to get these days on Amazon, but if you can prove out that you have counterfeit products um, that are being sold, there's an opportunity for brand gating or there's programs at Amazon that may give you the ability like Launchpad to get brand gating. Are you doing test buys, et cetera? Um, we've seen a number of brands in the last couple of weeks say, hey, my sales are down 15% versus a couple of months ago. And when we looked at it, it was 100% due to the lost buy box. And, uh, and in many of those scenarios, they weren't aware of that. So I think managing your channel uh, very tightly is going to be extremely important as you continue to scale. And then finally, and then we'll open it up to questions. There's a number of different features that have continued to be released by Amazon. We just reviewed a handful of them or two handfuls of them. Um, highly recommend that you're checking the new section on Seller and Vendor Central at least two times a week so that you're aware of some of these new features. <clears throat> and keep in mind that Amazon's probably going to continue, may not seem groundbreaking that we can now see mobile uh, page views, or now we have an A-B testing tool. If you're a DTC brand, that's done most of your volume there. But from an Amazon perspective, it is a pretty big difference versus the information they provided six months ago or a year ago. I expect that Amazon will continue to move in this direction. So keep your eye out and make sure that you're leveraging some of these new tools. All right, love to open up the questions. I know that was a ton of content. It went kind of quickly, but hopefully um, you got some nuggets as, as part of the process. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And um, thanks for the uh, presentation. It was very illuminating. Um, uh, my question has to do with um, you put up there, uh, you know, a, a, essentially a quote from Jeff Bezos saying that the three P's are, are kicking our butt. Um, 
but the um, right before that, you had a page where you where you had this this trend line, and then the page after that, you essentially um, it looked to me like Amazon had just sort of given up and were was sort of embracing the three P's. And um, uh, in, in our context, we're an importer and we've got uh, exclusive rights to the, this, this territory, to the US. And um, we have three P's coming in and undercutting us by one cent and taking over the buy box. Um, so, uh, you know, for instance, I can think of one particular ASIN that was, we were, we only had, we had less than 1% of the purchases for something like the last three months of that ASIN. This gives you how, just an idea how bad the, the 3P problem is. And I'm just wondering, you know, before it was brand registry, now it's now it's transparency. Is there really any um, willingness at Amazon to solve this, whether it's gray market or what, to solve this problem? Yeah, so it's a great question. Thanks for that, Alexander. Um, broad strokes, Amazon, I think, has taken steps, but I don't see them eliminating resellers or adhering to any kind of authorized sellers only across the board. They may do it in specific circumstances, but unless you're Apple, you're probably not going to get Apple to uh, Amazon to, to adhere to some of those policies. I think what Amazon's trying to do in many of those scenarios is they're continuing to say, we prefer to work with brand owners. And that doesn't mean you can't work with an agency or, or distributor you know, at all, or some of those things in the agency perspective, very different actually. Um, uh, answer, but what they are, what they typically are doing is many of those tools that we just reviewed now are only available if you are the brand owner. So if you have brand registry for that, that doesn't solve the, the fact that people can resell and win the buy box on on your um, on your offer. And during the pandemic, there was a ton of back and forth, and Amazon got a, a bunch of negative press where FBM sellers of your product. Um, weren't able to win the buy box, even though they were able to get it there quicker because of some of the delays that Amazon had or cheaper. And Amazon had to make a tweak to the algorithm and to allow 3P sellers. And then there was a, a ton of thrash they got saying that they went too far in that direction. So I think it could probably be an ongoing battle. And Amazon, if you can prove that brands, a reseller is not selling legitimate product or, um, or is doing something that's kind of infringing on your trademark or they're selling a different version than, than what it's, Listed, I think Amazon clearly has tools to try to combat that. If it's a reseller that's buying your product through um, another distributor, if you're a distributor, but there's a smaller one that's willing to make one cent on the product um, and is, is bringing some of those things down, I don't think there are great tools in place yet. There are 3P enforcement services out there that you can look into. Amazon recently provided contact info for brands in the US um, sellers. If you click on the seller's name, you can now get their address. So you, we've had brands that have been um, sending letters to other re re uh, resellers and have had some level of success, success, but admittedly, I don't, I don't expect Amazon's going to solve um, or do anything drastically different than what they've done, probably very progressively. Very good. Uh, I've got a question from Thu, and I'm going to turn on um, her microphone in just a moment. But before I do that, an anonymous question. Is there an alert to help identify when we have lost the buy box? Not through Amazon. There are some external services, something that um, we built uh, at, at AUC, some proprietary technology to do that. And there's a number of other um, third party service tools out there that um, can do some of that, that can give you alerts when you're losing the buy box or when, when some of your content gets updated, et cetera. But Amazon hasn't um, created anything through their platform that will, uh, that will notify you. You have to leverage some of these external tools or create something internally, unfortunately. Very good. Thu, go ahead, please. Sure. Um, I, my name is Tu Novak at Nutiva. 
Um, just a quick question on, um, you know, as you manage your, your margin, your portfolio on Amazon being a 1P brand, how would you suggest brands utilizing that hybrid model of a 1P as well as a 3P uh, marketplace? A great question. I think it's going to be, um, it depends very specifically on the brand. Uh, right now, when I, I used to be a category manager and managed a team of vendor managers, and if a brand a few years back said they were on Seller Central, it became very contentious. It created a very contentious situation. I think at, um, now there's opportunities where either some brands are doing it um, a little bit more in the background. They have a 3P account and they're doing different products. So it doesn't flag any issues and they're doing it for products that Amazon doesn't um, yet buy. Um, so it's not competing in the same ASINs or when Amazon's out of stock, they're leveraging it. Um, and we've had some brands be a little bit more open with their vendor manager. And in some scenarios, the vendor manager is, op is open to it um, as well. At the end of the day, the vendor manager doesn't want to see that you're compressing your price or causing issues or losing the buy box to your 3P account. Whether you let them know or not, that's ultimately what's going to push their buttons. So some of the ways that brands have, have leveraged the hybrid model to success is certain SKUs on vendors, certain SKUs on sellers, certain use cases on when they want vendor to win versus when they want to have seller to win. There's some products where vendor from a margin perspective is going to be significantly better. And there's probably some products where seller um, on, within your same catalogs would be very different. And if you haven't yet launched it on vendor, again, depending on your relationship with the vendor manager, if at all, and the size of your brand, et cetera, um, I think there's a couple of different ways to go at it. I think you have to be very thoughtful um, if you do go down that approach. Um, but again, Amazon's making it a little bit easier than it, than it was a couple of years ago. And, uh, and in some scenarios for brands that are under a certain sales threshold in a certain category, the vendor manager said, you know what, admittedly, I think you're probably better suited on Seller Central entirely for a couple of different reasons. I wouldn't go to the vendor manager and say, hey, you're not accepting my price increases on your top seller, which is a $7 million a year product for you. So as a result... I'm going to go on Cell Central. I think that's where you create some of the, that confrontation that you'd like to avoid. But I think there is there is um, very sensible and smart ways that you could leverage a hybrid model um, in, the, in in certain scenarios. A couple questions from uh, from an anonymous uh, attendee: Are Amazon posts available for one P and three P sellers? Yes. Second question: How can one calculate CLV on Amazon? as this is an emerging KPI for e-commerce, though it's an established metric for shopper? Yeah, it's a great question. Amazon doesn't make it easy. We do a couple of different things internally. Um, we create a couple of proprietary tools. A couple of ways that you can get around it is if you are if you have a subscribe and save enabled, you can look at some of the sub subscribe and save reports. If you're on Cell Central, you can download the customer reports and find um, uh, repeats in some of the customer information by adding different tags and filters. You can look at um, the new to brand on advertising and see what percentage of customers are new to brand for uh, those key terms, although that's for sponsored brand primarily. So there's a couple of different ways like that that I think you can get at it. If you're working with um, Amazon on a DSP campaign, they can provide some additional information on how many times a year a customer purchases. And then from there, you can extrapolate where your LTV is. So unfortunately, there's not a there's not a drop down within Amazon that provides that. And again, that seems like that should be table stakes because I'm direct to consumer as well as I'm shopper. Those are areas that you know very well. Um, but I think there's ways to get kind of close enough by putting those different pieces together. Very good. I don't see any other questions. I, I'm going to make myself look really stupid maybe by offering something as a, as, as a way of wrapping up, but it, it seems like brands really don't have a choice anymore. Uh, you know, I, I hear a lot of chirping in the community about how difficult it's become, especially for smaller sellers to be on Amazon, but even lifetime value, when you, when you said that so many shoppers are going to Amazon first to do their, to do the research, even if they don't purchase on research, it would be almost impossible to term to determine what what's the real lifetime value of that of that person that's even there doing the research, even if they don't buy, and and no matter how burdensome it's it's become and and how you know the margins have been impacted, it seems like you, you really have to be on Amazon, right? Um, but the second part of that, and I'm, I know you'll correct me if, if if you see it differently, but it seems like the platform has gotten complicated enough that it would be really difficult for for a, a small seller, especially. To, to go it alone, like like they did in the in the early days, it's become so sophisticated that it seems like you'd need 
you know, people or teams that are, that are more specialized. And I guess that's where you and your team would, would come in, but I'll mm-hmm. offer some you know, feedback on, on each of those points, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. Um, first comment um, uh, around the impact that Amazon has. Amazon recently enabled a beta called the Omni Channel Metrics, where we, um, we've been working with some of uh, our larger brands to see they look at IRI data and they try to they try to measure how much impact did your advertising ad have for on your physical retail presence. And some of those numbers, and they've been able to connect the dots. Um, and there's a ton of, of, of additional features that they're trying to add as part of that. Pretty significant. Like we, I've seen Forrester had a had a, a stat a while back that said for every dollar that's spent online, it has an impact of six dollars offline. And some of the omni-channel metrics are not that far off, meaning for every $10,000 you're spending on, on Amazon, it may have a three to six X impact on your sales off of Amazon. So I, you're absolutely right. I think from things like customer lifetime value. And I think that's why everything, you want a comprehensive view on Amazon. You want to look at, you, you have to look at ROAS and some of the basic things on a single purchase from an efficiency standpoint, but you got to look at your total sales. You got to look at your lifetime value. You got to look at your impact off of Amazon, et cetera. So I think, uh, it's one of those platforms that it's probably a product research platform, even more so than a sales platform. So um, spend time on it. Even if you have products that you don't want to sell a ton of on there, it's better you create it than a third party seller creates it um, uh, or a reseller. So that's kind of point one. And point number two, like going at it alone at like, I think it's Amazon has continued to get more sophisticated and still going to continue to add more features. Even Amazon advertising, I'd say the average person three years ago could probably get at it. But oftentimes brands are saying, hey, I don't want to spend four hours a day focusing on advertising um, alone. And that's not including my shipments. It's not including like monitoring some of this stuff daily. And that's where I think finding a partner, uh, an agency, a reseller, hiring a team internally to help manage that, whatever um, the right route is, is um, extremely important because chances are you're not going to be able to capture this. We do because we're looking at this every every five seconds. And I, I, I wake up and I go to sleep thinking about Amazon. And if a brand is not doing that on, on the platform, chances are that they absolutely can uh, and get it done if they, they hire the right team internally, but it's just a little bit more difficult. Yeah, yeah. Well, great. Thank you so much for, for doing this. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to share uh, your contact information or that of someone on your team that would be a, you know the perfect place for someone to engage if they've got more questions. But before we do that, I just want to let you know, again, conversations on retail, this is not intended to be a one and done event. What we want to do is create communities within the community, people that are like-minded and like interested. And, and um, uh, so uh, I, I would encourage you to pay attention to what we're doing. We're going to have a lot more conversations like these, focus on Amazon and other, other topics, certainly a lot about e-commerce. So uh, pay attention if you're not receiving our newsletter, you know, sign up for that and we'd uh, happy to, 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 get you, to get you plugged in. Uh, Fahim, if you would, uh, as a way of um, uh, you know, wrapping things up and saying so long, if, if you would share the, the very best way for someone to get in touch with you or with someone from your team, if they're interested in learning more about what it is you do and how you can help them. Absolutely, appreciate it. Feel free to email me. I can read out my email, but it's probably the longest email in the history of the world, fahim.naim at advantagesolutions.net. But if you contact me on LinkedIn, I'd be happy to accept. And if you have any questions, um, I can always engage the team accordingly. There's a number, if you go into uh, Google at Advantage Unified Commerce, there's probably other ways, a couple of different ways to contact. We're a uh, close-knit group, so if you ever have any questions, I'm sure uh, we can make sure that we, we get you connected with the right people and we get answers. Okay, that sounds great. Again, thank you so much for the time you've invested, not only in, in presenting and sharing with us this afternoon, but in, in uh, preparing and freeing some time up on your schedule. Look forward to seeing you again soon, Fahim, and the rest of the folks who have joined us. Until then, have a great day. Yeah, so appreciate long. it. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.